I come from a family of politicians. My father was one of the first people who was killed by Idi Amin. My family has never really left Uganda in spite of all the troubles, and so I always felt encouraged to come back and continue to develop my country, but through the sector that I was passionate about, which was wildlife conservation and veterinary medicine. A windy, impenetrable forest in western Uganda. This is one of the last expanses of untouched forest in Africa. Accessible only on foot, it's a biological treasure chest dating back to the last ice age. The forest is home to forms of life in spectacular diversity and profusion. Hundreds of species of trees, ferns, flowers and birds. But more than any of these, Bwindi is famous for nearly half the world's remaining population of mountain gorillas. Ten hours drive away in Entebbe, there's an organization determined to save the gorillas for future generations. So I think that one is something which I'd actually plan on. Conservation through public health is the brainchild of Gladys Kalema, a veterinary scientist with a passion for putting her skills into action. When I was in vet school in England, I was allowed to have some time to work on a species of my choice, and that's when I came to Buindi. And I think that's when I really fell in love with the gorillas and gorilla conservation. They're very similar to us. We share over 98.4% genetic material. And when you look at them, you feel like you're connecting. But the very few, there's less than a thousand mountain gorillas in the world. That's another reason why it's very appealing to work with them because I know that when you're saving a critically endangered species, you're preventing it from going to extinction and it's a priority. Gladys comes from a family of high achievers. Both her parents were figures of national importance. I come from a family of politicians. My father was one of the first people who was killed by Idi Amin because he was a very prominent politician. He did a lot of development for Uganda and I felt that it's important to continue his dream of developing the country. My mom joined politics when President Museveni came into power, she's well, the first woman MP and inspired very many other women MPs. She's got several awards from them. My family has always never really left Uganda. In spite of all the troubles, my mom has always stayed. And so I always felt encouraged to come back and continue to develop my country, but through the sector that I was passionate about, which was wildlife conservation and veterinary medicine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to push the breasts. Gladys is one of the wildlife vets that this country actually has got. She volunteered to go through the jungles of this country, the buindis of this country, the national parks, to go and treat gorillas, to go and treat chimpanzees. It's not very common for a lady, you know, to volunteer and go into such a scary area, but Gladys did this. A hundred years ago, Uganda was branded the Pearl of Africa. Within its borders, 
wildlife of every kind could be found in abundance. Then, in the 1970s, the dictatorship of Idi Amin, followed by years of civil war, saw an orgy of poaching that took many species to the edge of extinction. Since the mid-1980s, when peace was restored, there's been a serious effort to repair the damage. Gorillas in particular had been in danger of disappearing completely. But intense international interest is ensuring their survival for the time being. Gladys and her team have come to Buindi to track a family of gorillas that lives far off the normal tourist route. They'll be checking their health and making sure that there are no human threats nearby. Buindi is it's a very old forest with um, trees which are thousands of years old. It's got a very big diversity of trees, you know, plants, as well as animals. It was recently named a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So that's also another reason why Windy Penetrable National Park is very special. The gorillas live in a steep environment so when you're working with them you have to learn how to hike very steep hills so this is a nice beginning Gorilla families are constantly on the move. In one day, they can travel over a kilometer through the undergrowth, building a new nest for themselves every night. The process of finding them is often long, <laughs> sweaty, and arduous. The head guide, David, is calling out to the truckers to see the shortest way to get to them. They're ready with the gorillas, which is great. So we won't have to look for them. But if we don't move fast enough, the gorillas could still start moving and we still have to keep following them. I've ever been in a situation when we're in Congo, actually we're with Stephen here, and the truckers found the gorillas, but we took a long time to get to them and the gorillas started fighting with another group and we never saw them at all that day. So, we still have to hurry up and catch up with the truckers. We've just been joined by the warden for monitoring and research. His name is Raymond Kato. He's about to fall as well, like me. <laughs> and he stays here in Rohija, where the gorillas are close by. And he's come to find us quickly. And he, he, do, he monitors all the research and monitoring in the whole park. The group here on track is called Onzogo. Onzogo is the name of uh, a local name of a plant here in this part of the forest which this family likes feeding on.
With the gorillas now close by, the team splits up so that no more than eight people at any time get to see the gorillas directly. This is to minimize the disturbance to their way of life. It's also to reduce the risk of infection from humans. So right now here I have a sip of water which may contain you for approximately one hour because while with the gorillas you will be not drinking, no eating, no smoking. The rest of the porters all will stay behind. We are only moving with the truckers and they will be the ones who lead us to the gorillas. The direction of the vegetation shows you where you should follow them. They leave a very good trail on the ground. So we're lucky, that's how we track them. As you can hear, the gorillas are over there. They seem to be fighting over something. After several hours, the team finally catch a glimpse of what they've been looking for. Over here we're seeing a, a perfect family unit. There's the father who's lying on his stomach, the baby who's playing on him, a little infant that must be probably like one year old. And then you have a juvenile who's his older brother and then the mother. We're keeping this distance from the gorillas because we don't want to make them sick. Um, if we get any closer, in fact, we're still a little bit close, we can easily pass flu onto them or any other diseases. The younger ones especially, they want to come up to you. And also when you move too close, you disturb their behavior. So if we had moved closer, you would see that they start to behave differently. When gorillas keep meeting humans who don't threaten them, they gradually lose their fear. This is called habituation. It enables the gorillas to live more easily with the local people. People who might otherwise be poachers become rangers, looking after the gorillas who've now become a source of income from tourists. With higher income comes better health and a stronger desire still to conserve the gorillas. Whenever you bring, you habituate a gorilla group, the community changes. Uh, they get so many benefits. Their livelihoods change, their household income increases, their health improves. And so it's a very good group to be tracking at the moment because it's really going to make a difference to this particular community. These gorillas, they feed throughout the day. And when we are with them, they stop feeding and begin looking at us. So when you stay with them longer, they will not feed, you don't have enough food for that day. And the following day, they will move a very big truck. We're not healthy, and it was affecting conservation directly. You are going to be discussing some, some, some of our information in a few minutes. So we decided to hold workshops with eight villagers. We spoke to about a thousand people, and they came up with the best solutions, much better than I had designed. And 
that my, was my first introduction to participatory um, rural appraisal methods. And a lot of the suggestions they came up with are what we use to start our NGO. I saw committed conservation volunteers who are committed to deliver cities activities. To survive, gorillas have to be kept safe from human infection. So CTPH campaigns vigorously to improve hygiene among nearby people, preventing the spread of tuberculosis, scabies and dysentery. Here they learn that instead of hunting gorillas and clearing the forest, keeping gorillas safe and well generates more income from tourism. If you sold CTPH, how much would you pay? <laughs> Priceless. <laughs> Volunteers come from around the world to lend their support to Gladys and her team. Guy Hodkinson and Bernie Warmington have both been inspired to come and work among the local people. It's um, just really nice to come somewhere where something positive is being done and you feel like you have some kind of an influence over it rather than having news projected at you which is almost always bad so you know it's it's really good to get in there and try and change something firsthand. I've come here and within two weeks of being here I've met some of the most amazing people I could have imagined and for, for me the, the, the people and the atmosphere of the place is like nothing I've ever seen before it's unbelievable. <laughs> In the 90s, community conservation began all over the world, and Brindy was one of the very first successful examples, where from the very beginning, people who were poachers were turned into rangers and truckers, because they knew the forest really well, and we call them born-again poachers, because <laughs> now they're protecting the animals, and they're preventing other people from poaching them. And then, so the first thing that was done in Brindy was that the people from the around were employed by the park. CTPH is also heavily engaged in hard science. At this field laboratory, gorilla droppings are regularly examined for signs of disease. The Gorilla Research Clinic was built in 2005, and we have been monitoring the health of gorilla by collecting samples and analyzing in this lab. The gentleman behind me is looking at the gorilla dunk, which we always collect from the gorilla groups. We examine them as he's doing right now. We are looking for worms, which can be dangerous to, you, to human, to livestock, and also to wildlife, especially gorillas. If we find something wrong, we immediately inform Dr. Gladys Kalema Zikusoka, who is the principal investigator, to report immediately to the wildlife, Uganda Wildlife Authority for, for immediate intervention. CTPH has set up a network of local volunteers who educate their neighbors in better health practices. To support them, livestock projects have been introduced so that a separate income can subsidize their efforts. Local goats are vaccinated against diseases that would otherwise reach wildlife in the forest and possibly threaten the gorillas themselves. Regular health screening for goats and cattle has made an enormous difference to the prosperity of local people. <laughs> But perhaps the biggest challenge Uganda faces right now is the growth in the human population. At independence in 1962, 
Uganda had just 7 million people. Today, that number is five times higher at 35 million. Encroachment of the national parks has become a very big problem with high population growth. Uganda has about the highest in the world. Our growth rate is 3.3%, and the country is not getting any bigger. There's a lot of pressure on the government to dig us at the parks, and the politicians fall for that because they want votes. When you have children who you can manage, you can make sure they get proper health care, and they're less likely to get sick and make the gorillas sick, who they're closely related to. So that's how we got involved in the family planning, and it's actually been very successful. Within four years, we had a 12-fold increase in family planning users. It's all about balancing the family budget, and that's the message that needs to go across. The future of Uganda without reducing the population growth rate is very dismal. We really need to reduce that. At what training, Jeremy, to it was a much more courageous event. Courageous, I have family planning, I have a lot of rules, 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 I have as a leader, Gladys sets her own example. With just two children of her own, she's been careful to space them four years apart, just like the gorillas of Windy. I space my children like they do. They have children once every four years without modern family planning. And that helps them. The older one is old enough and independent emotionally and helps to help to look after the younger one. So Indigo and Tender are four and a half years apart. And I think it's good. If we did it in the, with humans, the world wouldn't be so overpopulated. <laughs> I've tried my best to always stick, hold them close to me. So I try and move with them as much as possible, spend as much contact with them as possible. And because I know that that contact is very important, children and their parents, they have it, they really develop well emotionally. But it's for her work with gorillas and their human neighbors that Gladys is most respected. By giving rural Ugandans an interest in conservation, she and her team have scored the double triumph of improving human health while ensuring the survival of the world's great apes. I've really enjoyed working with the women groups, actually. And I've enjoyed working with the women, our volunteers. They, it's, there's a very big connection with them, and they get inspired when they see a woman in leadership. They also have become leaders in their community. They've become conservation leaders in their community, and I'm sure it's inspired them because I'm a woman. One thing I would say for young girls is to follow your dream. Go for male-dominated professions if that's what they want to do, and the rest will follow. I've been an inspiration for my nieces. They found it fun to see their aunt holding a dart gun, darting an animal. <laughs> Gladys has got a passion, and I think this is the great and underlying factor that has uh, pushed her you know, work through the years. As a result, she has been involved in wildlife conservation at the policy level, and she has been giving invaluable information and management advice to us in terms of wildlife conservation in Uganda. As a pioneer in wildlife conservation, Gladys is destined to leave a legacy for future generations. It's a world in which Ugandans no longer look to outsiders to see the importance of preserving wildlife, gorillas in particular. I want to be remembered for bringing about systems that have promoted conservation by linking the health of the people and the health of the wildlife, which are interdependent. Empowering people to take charge of their situation and make their lives better. be known for making us our own fellow Africans to be champions of conservation, not only people from other countries.
but the very few, there's less than a thousand mountain gorillas in the world. That's another reason why it's very appealing to work with them because I know that when you're saving a critically endangered species, you're preventing it from going to extinction and it's a priority. Gladys comes from a family of high achievers. Both her parents were figures of national importance. I come from a family of politicians. My father was one of the first people who was killed by Idi Amin because he was a very prominent politician. He did a lot of development for Uganda and I felt that it's important to continue his dream of developing the country. My mom joined politics when President Museveni came into power. She's one of the first... It's a biological treasure chest dating back to the last ice age. The forest is home to forms of life in spectacular diversity and profusion. Hundreds of species of trees, ferns, flowers and birds. But more than any of these, Bwindi is famous for nearly half the world's remaining population of mountain gorillas. Ten hours drive away in Entebbe, there's an organization determined to save the gorillas for future generations. So I think that one is something which I'd actually plan on. Conservation through public health is the brainchild of Gladys Kalema, a veterinary scientist with a passion for putting her skills into action. When I was in vet school in England, I was allowed to have some time to work on a species of my choice, and that's when I came to Bwindi. And I think that's when I really fell in love with the gorillas and gorilla conservation. They're very similar to us. We share over 98.4% genetic material. And when you look at them, you feel like you're connected. I come from a family of politicians. My father was one of the first people who was killed by Idi Amin. My family has never really left Uganda in spite of all the troubles. And so I always felt encouraged to come back and continue to develop my country, but through the sector that I was passionate about, which was wildlife conservation and veterinary medicine. A windy impenetrable forest in western Uganda. This is one of the last expanses of untouched forest in Africa. Accessible only on foot, 